Good morning, good morning. How is everyone doing this morning? Dave's good. I heard an awesome. Anybody else? You're awesome. Brother Ed, how are you today? Great. All right. Great. All right. Anybody ready to laugh? I got a couple jokes for you. Did somebody say, oh, no? How dare you? You know, we're getting ready to have kickoff season or Sunday, next Sunday for football and all the college sports and pro sports. I am ready. I am a senior dad. We've got good news this week. Last week wasn't looking so good for the foot. He's here today. God has answered prayers. The swelling has gone down. He has ran on it. He is, we're ready to go, aren't we, bud? Go Warriors. Amen. But anyway, how do you know Pharaoh was athletic? He had a court, Pharaoh's court. Dave, I love you, buddy. We are cut from the same cloth, same haircut, everything. I like this one, too, because what have we been dealing with the past, this will be number nine, I believe. What's the pastor been preaching? Ten Commandments. Which servant of God was the most flagrant lawbreaker in the Bible? Moses, he broke all Ten Commandments at once. And I'll prove it, Exodus 32, 19, when Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. So he broke every one of them all at once, amen? Let's all stand this morning. We've come to have fun in Christ, amen? It's okay, it's okay to laugh and have a good time in the house of the Lord, amen? Has he saved your soul this morning? In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your Oh, no. 
altar at a young age as this next song sings and gave my life to Christ. I thought about it yesterday. It was 1971. Sister Sharon, I believe, gave her heart to Christ. And she's doing that this morning. She is rejoicing around the throne. Hallelujah. Oh, come to the altar this morning. If you need him in your life, these altars are always open. You don't have to wait till the end. Thank you, Jesus. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh 
Bear your cross as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Jesus is calling Hallelujah Yes, you are, Lord Thank you, Jesus Come on, church, worship him this morning Hallelujah We thank you, Father, for calling us out Jesus, when you did You said you'd leave the 99 Just to come back for that one And I thank you, Father For coming back for that one That was me, Jesus Hallelujah We thank you today, Lord, Father God We praise you As we run to you, Father God Daily Daily, Lord, we're not perfect And we know we need to run to you As the song says, over and over again We're here in your presence today, Lord Jesus Touch your people as we run to you today Thank you, Jesus Run to him today He's waiting for you With those arms wide open today
is one of the most beautiful things about our Lord. It doesn't matter what burdens we carry. It doesn't matter what we feel in our heart. It doesn't matter if we're tired, if we're heavy in heart, if we're sorrowful, if we're in pain. If we're even in sin, we can come to the Father. We can come to Him and find whatever it is we need. We can be strengthened. We can be encouraged. We can be lifted up. Joy can be given. Healing can be given. Salvation can be given. So whatever it is you need for God, I want Brent to sing that again. And I want you, these altars are going to be open. I want you to come to the Father. And whatever need you have, whether it's sorrow in heart, whether it's pain in your soul, whether it's salvation, healing, whatever it is you need, I want you to come forward and come to the Father and ask whatever you will, believing that He is going to provide what you need in your heart today. Because I don't know about you, my heart's heavy. I'm really, 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 really tired from the emotions of yesterday and the pain that we feel at the loss of a sister. But I want to run to the Father too. I want to come to Him and ask Him for strength. I want to come to Him and ask Him for a touch, for joy unspeakable, full of glory, peace that surpasses all understanding. So whatever your need is, I invite you to come to the Father's brand. Run to the Father, fall into grace, done with the hiding, of reason to wait. My heart needs a search, my soul needs so I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Whoa, 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 again and again. Whoa, 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 whoa. I run to the Father.
It doesn't matter what we have inside of us. Sometimes we feel tired. I mean, this morning when I woke up, I mean, I slept well, but I woke up exhausted. And I'm like, God, you got to help me today. And whether we're bringing to him our pain or bringing him our, our weariness or our sorrow, whether we're even bringing him our sin, we can come to the Father. We can come to God Almighty and receive whatever it is that we need. He, he allows us to meet him as we are. He doesn't expect us to, to hide in the darkness and get perfect before we come into his presence. He wants us to come into his presence as we are in truth. And, 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 and when we do that, he accepts whatever we are, and He'll take whatever we're willing to give Him. If we're willing to praise Him out of our weariness, He will be glorified in that. If we're willing to praise Him, although we're tired, although we're in pain, although our hearts are broken, we can take that brokenness and give it to God and praise Him and worship Him through it. And I want to encourage you to do that, to worship His holy name, to glorify Him for who He is, and to be able to take yourself. Don't think you have to be perfect. Don't you think you have to put on a suit and a tie and be some holy, righteous person to come into the presence of God. He came, and He came to deliver. He came to set free. Jesus Christ still is the Savior of the world. He still saves, and He saves me much today as He saved me when I first gave my life to Him. Allow Jesus to meet you where you are and worship Him with all that you got in you. You say, well, I don't have anything in me. Then worship Him with that. If you don't have enough strength to raise your hands, raise your heart to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. As we pray, of course, please keep remembering the Summers family in your prayer. Also keep remembering the Brookins family and Daniel's mom in your prayer for them to be comforted and for God's will to be done. And there are so many others who have needs, so many others who have something in their life. And I, and I, I want to just have a bit of honesty. Today we're going to be talking about honesty. If you have a need, just raise your hand. You don't have to speak it out. Just raise your hand. Anything in your life, whether it's healing, salvation for someone, salvation for yourself, encouragement, you're just tired, whatever it is, God sees your hand. He knows that need. And also I want you to remember that one person. That one person in your life that you want to see come to Christ more than any other. You want to see them changed and transformed by the blood of the Lamb. It could be a child. It could be a parent. It could be a neighbor, a friend, a colleague, whoever it is. And again, I want to call out their name before God as we pray here today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. I thank you that no matter what we go through, that we can come to you again and again and again and again. You never grow tired of us coming to you. You never grow tired of us saying, Abba, Father, Daddy, I need you. I need you right now. I need you more than I've ever needed you in my life. I need you to give me joy. I need you to give me peace. I need you to provide for me. I need you to take care of me. And I pray, Lord God, for our families who are in sorrow, the Summers family. We also pray for the Brookins family that you will just provide a touch from heaven, a touch that they can't explain, a touch that they cannot quantify, but they know it is from heaven, it is from you peace that they need, that joy, that comfort from the Holy Spirit that only you can provide, that only comes from above. We pray that they'll receive that. And for every hand that was raised, every need that was represented, I pray you will meet that need according to your will and according to your purpose and plan for each life and each family. And we call upon the name of our lost loved ones. I call upon the name of Aladdin and then in the name of every person represented here, that lost person that we love so much that we want to see enter the kingdom of God. We want to see enter a relationship with you. We pray that somehow, some way, you will save their soul. You will ignite a fire in their heart and allow that seed that has been planted to be watered and birth forth fruit for the kingdom of God. And we pray this in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. You know, this is the first time in 15 months, as Brent was singing, I'm thinking, I might not be preaching today. But I don't know about you, I feel, I mean, I always feel a sense of God's presence when we come together, because God promised us. Jesus promised us when two or three gather in his name, he is here. But today, I feel something special brewing. I feel something special. And so... I just want to welcome you and thank you for coming. Uh, I met some new people at the church door, some people that I didn't recognize. Some of you might know who they are. So I want to welcome you to Kincaid Church of God. Anyone watching online, I want to welcome you. And we want to continue our worship with tithes and offerings. 
Now, we mention tithes and offerings every service, and we should. A church should never be apologetic about receiving tithes and offerings. It is a statute of Scripture. It cannot be argued. It cannot be denied. It is not an Old Testament concept. It is not a New Testament concept. It's a biblical concept. It is a statute of the Lord. But we often talk about the tithe, and we should, because it is a statute of the Lord. It never changes. It requires obedience. It's a statement of love and commitment. And in fact, we don't even give the tithe. We simply return the tithe because it already belongs to him. The Bible is very strict about how the tithe is to be given only into the storehouse of God, the church, the body of Christ. We do not have a choice in where we put the tithe. We cannot give the tithe to a missionary. We cannot give the tithe to some TV preacher. We cannot send the tithe here or there. The tithe belongs to the church. But the offering is also a command of God. It is also important. However, with the offering, the place of where the offering goes, we have a choice. Now, the offering is above the tithe. It is, it is over the 10% that God requires. But we get to decide. We can give it to missions or outreach. We can give it to benevolence. We can give it to things like the building program that we have here at our church. We can give it to people in need. But Hebrews 13, 16 says, And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. God is pleased when we give. Now, I was trying to come up with an illustration, and I'm going to admit this time, I got this one off the Internet, all right, because I was just really tired this morning. And I'm thinking, God, I'm, I have nothing. you got to give me something. And he gave me Google, all right. So I read this story about this woman. She was traveling, and, you know, and of course, you know, as, as missionaries, we used to travel a lot, so I can kind of connect to this story. And she was in the airport, and she was changing from one plane to another. She had a little bit of a long layover, so she went to the store, and she bought a pack of cookies and a newspaper. And she went to her gate, and she sat down, and she started reading the newspaper. And after a while, she heard some rustling. And to her surprise, when she lowered the newspaper, a nice, clean-dressed man sitting across from her was eating her cookies. And she was shocked. And she was very, very angry, and, and you know, she's trying to keep her cool, so she just reached over and took one of the cookies and ate it. And they did this for a little while longer. And, and then to her surprise, at the end, the very last cookie, the man broke it in half, slid half of it over to her, and he ate the other half. She was furious. How could he do this? Well, the man went on to his, his, to his aircraft, and then she sat there a little while longer thinking, how in the world could someone do this? How in the world could someone steal my cookies? And then she got on her plane, and she, she got on her plane, she opened her purse, and to her surprise was a bag of cookies that she had bought in the store. So it's always good to give, isn't it? Yeah. So I'd like to invite the ushers to come. It's okay to laugh in church. God gave us humor. And remember as we give we give unto the Lord and do it so with a cheerful heart. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to give. Everything we have has been given to us by you. We return to you the tithe and then we give the offering. And I just pray that you will settle on our heart where you want it to go. So that we will use it for your glory, for your purpose, not for our own recognition, not for some sort of tax credit, but that we give because we love you. We give because we want to help other people. We give for your glory and for your plan. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. about you, whatever you came to the Father for, but I know I feel a strength in me that I didn't have about 10 minutes ago, so I praise God for that. Some announcements, uh, Next, just one announcement, next Sunday is football kickoff Sunday, so we're encouraging you all to wear crimson and white. <laughs> 
<laughs> now, you wear your team colors, whether it's high school, college, or pro. Uh, I think crimson's a very beautiful color. The ushers were wearing it this today, you know. Uh, <laughs> what is that? No, I didn't set that up. That was Alan. He's become an Alabama fan and doesn't even know it, so... Yeah, no, but this, this is just something that we do for fun, and we come up with these little theme days, and we just do it for fun. Don't feel any pressure to go buy anything. Uh, if you have something, you can wear it, whether it's a lion eye or whatever your high school team is. Uh, I actually bought a, a shirt. I'm not going to wear it, but I bought a shirt from my high school when I, we were in Alabama visiting my parents. And because uh, I, I went to Arab High School, A-R-A-B, and uh, my football team was called the Arabian Nights. And... Uh, the, in the Middle East, they always thought it was funny because they always called me the white Arab because I was from Arab. So, uh, but I, won't, I, I probably won't wear that one. But do wear that next week. Also, we want to thank everyone, and there were so many of you that helped out yesterday. Either you cooked or you served or you cleaned or whatever. We just want to thank you so much. I mean, it, it was just such a blessing. Also, we want to thank, as a church, I mean, even though they're not here, we want to thank Ken K. Diner. They gave us the chicken at cost. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't make any profit off the chicken that we bought from them, and which is to me is, was a blessing, and I want to bless them back in, re, in, in return. Uh, so I probably, yeah, again, yeah. So if you ever do eat in the diner, please thank them if you see them. Just thank them for that because I know it means a lot to the church, and I know it would mean a lot to the Summers family that they were willing to do that. And, and as a church, I plan to support them from, you know, from now on. If we, even if it costs a little bit more, when someone's willing to do that, uh, to me, it's just a special thing. I'd like to have the children come forward. All children. If you don't come forward, you can't go to children's church. I, I know how to be a parent. <laughs> Uh, you never said, hey, you don't eat all your dinner, you're not getting a cookie? <laughs> well, I'm glad you come and stood by me. Did you do that on purpose? <laughs> Good. All right. Let's stretch our hands towards our kids, pray for them. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for our children. I thank you for their life. I thank you for their soul. I thank you that you have brought them to this church. And I pray that you will be with them as they go. I pray that you will plant that seed of the gospel deep inside of them, water it, help it to bear fruit. Help them to grow up to be people who love you and serve you and maybe even proclaim your gospel here or around the world. We pray that you will use them in their schools. You will use them in their families. We pray for their teachers that you will be with them and watch over them and also speak to their hearts and bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you can go to the back. Whoops. You know, sometimes I'm wondering if I should be a little bit more specific when I pray. Like, God, give me strength for the next 45 minutes. Because uh, the way I feel now, I might preach for two or three hours. So, amen. There we go. You know, I also, I also teach on Wednesday nights, Ronnie. Yeah. yeah. Every Wednesday night we have church. You know, I also want to, you know, it, this is not in the announcements, but I also want to promote on Monday night, at 6 o'clock, we have prayer. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Not a lot of people come, okay? Uh, however, there has never been a time, and, we, and, there's, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this, there's a lot of times I don't want to come, okay? Because, you know, it's at the end of the day, you're thinking, oh, I don't want to go, I don't want to be there, but I have never, ever regretted coming. And I can't tell you how many things that we pray for that actually happen. I mean, I, and I'm not going to be specific because... <laughs> Some of you have been prayed for and things happen, and you don't even know that we were praying for you. But I want to encourage you if you can. Okay, now it's usually from 6 o'clock, and now sometimes we can be a little long-winded. Uh, it's all Dave's fault, but we, we, a little, no. we, we can be a little long-winded. However, if you come, you don't have to come right at 6 if you don't want. You probably won't get in the door if you don't come right at 6. But if you need to leave after, at 6.30, 6.45, then leave. That's fine. No one's going to think poorly of you because you don't stay for the whole prayer meeting. But I'm going to tell you something. If we want to transform our community, if we want to transform central Illinois, which I don't know about you, that's my goal, is that first God transforms us, and through transforming us, we help 
him and we participate with him in transforming this area, it's going to happen through prayer. And not just sitting at home alone prayer, which is very, very, very important, but also corporate prayer. And so I want to encourage you to do that. And also on Sunday morning, there's a small group who gather here at 10 o'clock to pray for the service. And I appreciate that. As a pastor, I appreciate that so much. And again, you don't have to come in here and shout and run around the aisles and you know, hang from the lights and all that. You just come in here and pray for the service. Pray that souls will be changed, that every person who enters, that God will speak to them in some sort of way, whatever you want to pray. And I can tell you, that prayer, even again, though it's just a few people, makes a difference. Because I believe that everything that happens in our church happens because we pray and because God hears that. And so I want to just encourage you. I don't want to make you feel guilty about it. I know some of you live you know, far off. Some of you have to get up very early in the morning to go to work the next day. But I do encourage you, if you can, every now and then, to show up for the Monday night prayer. Okay? All right, we're going to continue our series on the Ten Commandments. I hope you know how many uh, sermons are in this series. <laughs> there, are, there are ten, by the way. Uh, we are on number nine. So next week we will conclude this series. And uh, we will start, uh, I will probably preach a couple of individual single sermons before I start the next series. Uh, uh, and there will be a Sunday next month that I will, not, I will not be here. Carrie and the girls will be here. So she will tell me if you stay home just because the pastor's not here. I know how churches work. I remember when I was a missionary, I used to hate it. The pastor would invite me to speak in his church, and then he would go on vacation. And then he would tell the church he was going on vacation. So I pretty much preached to empty pews when I was there. But, but anyway, so it's a thing of, uh, on the, I think the 18th of September... Uh, Brother Jerry Thorpe, pastor in Taylorville, will be speaking for us. I wanted to ask Jerry uh, for a while, and he's actually having to find someone to preach for him. So, but he said that he would do it and that he was honored, and I really want to encourage you to support that and to support Jerry. And Carrie will be here uh, to, to moderate the service. But in this ninth commandment, uh, this one's going to be fun. Okay, So you might as well go ahead and stomp your own toes because it's about to happen. And I prayed a lot uh, about my attitude when it comes to preaching this because I want to preach it with, with the right heart. And we, you know, we talked about that the Ten Commandments are a way that we can have a better relationship with God and each other, that it was not a list of rules. It is a list of principles that God gave us to have those healthy relationships. But this one's hard for me to preach because I don't know about you, I hate when someone lies to me. I absolutely hate when someone lies to me. I mean... And, and to be honest, I have a good memory. And so I usually can pick up when someone is lying to me. I mean, I don't usually forget what people tell me. Don't usually. I'm, I'm getting older, and that's getting a little bit less impressive as it used to be. Uh, but in my education, I was trained to read body, body language, kinetics, eye movements, and those kind of things in order to learn culture. But it also can tell you if a person is telling the truth or not. I have discernment from the Holy Spirit that God has given me as a gift, and you can pick up on it sometimes that way. And then sometimes I have a brain, and you can tell when some, because sometimes, uh, let's just be honest, some people are not very good at lying. I mean, they lie a lot, but they're just not very good at it. But I do want to preach this with the right heart, because I want all of us to be free from the bondage that lying can place us in. All of us. Because let's be honest, we've all done it. And if you say you have never lied, you just lied, and so at the end, you'll have a chance to repent of that. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, it says, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. We often shorten this commandment to basically say, You shall not lie, which is at the heart of the commandment itself. And throughout Scripture, it supports that, that, that summary of this commandment. There are no lies that are not sin. None. No lie is okay according to scripture. And in this text, when it refers to neighbor, you may wonder who that is talking about. Basically, neighbor refers to anyone in your life. Anyone you meet, anyone you bypass, anyone you see at the store, anyone you see at work, anyone in your family, anyone in your neighborhood is your neighbor. Because Jesus was asked, who is our neighbor? And when he t that's when he told the story of the Good Samaritan, basically saying, everyone is your neighbor. Even the people you don't like so much is your neighbor. False witness in the scripture is important because God was trying to establish a society when he set people, the people of Israel free from Egypt and he was giving them this foundation in the Ten Commandments that this new society would live by and go by. 
This is what he wanted them to do. You see, morality is not based in me, in what I think. You know, I know in our country today that you'll hear, well, is it right for you? Well, it doesn't matter if it's right for you. If it is against God's word, it is not right. Morality is not based in what I think. It's not based in how I feel. It's not based in my family. It's not based in my culture. It's not based in my nationality. It is based in the word of God and the word of God alone. In fact, anthropologists have proven that in a culture, in a country, that the morality of the major religion in that country that the morality of the people even outside of that religion can never bypass the majority religion of that country. And that should alarm us as Americans, because in America, where the church is continuing to compromise and compromise, where the morality of the church has continued to be lowered, it will lower the morality of our nation as a whole. But if we will return to the Word of God, we will return to what the Word of God says, and raise up our morality to the standard of holiness that God has given us, then the, by, by very definition, the morality of our nation should begin to increase because the gospel will spread. See, too many people in the church have watered the gospel down and pushed it down in an attempt to try to appease more people to get them in the church. But that's not how you build the church. The way you build the church is by preaching the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is not in what you and I do that builds the church. It is what the Holy Spirit does through the word of God. And if we will preach the truth, the true church will return. If we will preach the truth, the people who are seeking the truth, not to be tickled their ears or not to be patted on the back all the time, but the truth of the word of God, the church will grow. And I promise you, as long as I am the pastor of this church, I will never, ever water down the gospel of Jesus Christ. If it comes to just me and my wife sitting in this church alone, we will preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in truth. Not out of arrogance, out of love, spoken, truth spoken in love. But morality must be based solely on the word of God. Now God gave us th- this commandment and he gave it to Israel to be used in legal proceedings. But it was also to reach their entire life. You see, in this time when there was a dispute in Israel, it would be settled by an elder. An elder was a male over 50 years old. So I guess now I'm an elder. Uh, And Carrie, you're an elder. (laughs) Oh, I'm in trouble when I get home. Okay. (laughs) Forgiveness is a Christian trait. But you would have this this dispute question, and an elder would oversee it, and there had to be at least two witnesses in order to bring an accusation against another person. Now, this was done at the gate of the city, and guilt and innocence was primarily decided on by the testimony of these two witnesses, or two or more witnesses. So you didn't want someone being punished under false testimony, so the commandment was given. Now, capital, in capital crimes, this is very important, because in capital crimes in Israel, the way that people were punished, the way people were put to death, was by stoning. And if you don't know what stoning is, it is basically where the person is buried from the waist down, and then you throw rocks at them until they die. But the thing about it was, is those who brought the testimony against this person, they had to be the first ones to cast the stone. So if you brought a witness against someone and you said this person had committed something that was worthy of death, you had to throw the stone first. And that's why Jesus even said what he said when the woman who was caught in adultery was brought to him. He said, whoever has not sinned, you throw the first stone. He was, just a, he, he was following the law, okay? But also, too, the one thing that I always thought was interesting about that story, this is a little side note, have you ever noticed that she was caught in the the very act of adultery, but they didn't bring the guy? You know, I I don't know if you know this, it takes two to have adultery, and the guy was not there. He was probably one of their buddies or something. But But God was trying to establish a moral code, but the heart of the ninth commandment is that God wants truth in all that we do. He wants us to only speak the truth. Not only does he strongly condemn lying, the Bible is very clear, he hates lying. Leviticus 19 and 11, you shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, and you shall not lie to one another. Colossians 3, 9, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices. 
Revelation 21, 6 and 8. As he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abdominal, the murderers, the sexual immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. In case we didn't believe him the second time, Revelations 22, 14, and 15. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right of the tree of life, and may go through the gates to the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexual immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Now, when you look at the sins listed there, that line is included in those sins. Murder, idolatry, sexual immorality. We can see that God takes honestly very seriously. And that is the principle of the ninth commandment. Honesty. To be honest. God wants us to be honest in every aspect of our life, in every relationship we have, with everyone we come in contact with, our neighbor. So the question is, I'm going to ask you today, and it's probably going to offend you, and I don't really care because this is my job. God told me to do this. Are you a liar? Now, no one likes to be said you're a liar, but are you a liar? Now, we have to be honest. Don't lie about being a liar. And you say, because what would we say? Sometimes. Well, if you sometimes lie, doesn't that make us a liar? Isn't the, answer, isn't the only possible answer, if are you a liar, is yes or no? Because if you lie sometimes, then you are a liar. And if you say no, are you lying? Now let me just say this, lying is much more biblically than what we expect. Even to exaggerate, let me make it clear, to exaggerate with the purpose of deception is a lie. Okay? Now, okay, I know everybody who's gone fishing, you know, you had a fish this big, and before you felt, you know. Is that a lie? Probably. Because this is what lying basically is. When we're trying to enhance our stories to make us look better. When we're trying to change, we're trying to prevent people from looking at us negatively. How much do you care what people think of you? Now, I know as Americans, we always say, I don't care what anybody thinks. Really? Really? Our culture would say otherwise. We have a culture that's all about impressing everybody, yet we say we don't care what anybody thinks. We have a culture that stresses be an individual, be yourself, and then a culture that says if you're not like everybody else, something's wrong with you. you and we wonder why our young people are so messed up. Have you ever told someone you're going to be late and then lie about the reason I mean, that you were late and you lie about the reason that you were late? Now, let me tell you something. When I lived in Dubai and someone told me it was the traffic, I believed them. In Kincaid, I don't buy that story. Sorry, Pastor, the traffic was horrible on 104 today. Have you ever said you're going to do something and not do it? Like come to church on Wednesday night. No amen, brother? <laughs> I'm going to get you to church on Wednesday no matter what I have to do. So, Have you ever flattered people when you don't believe what you're saying and you call it honoring them? That's called, well, I better be careful, I'll lose my license. Okay, I was going to say that's called General Assembly, but I'm not going to say that. Actually, I did say that, didn't I? Yeah. Do you not tell the truth to save people's feelings? Now, let me just say this, men especially. You can be much more diplomatic about it. My wife, to this day, will never ask me, how do I look? Because very, very early, I want to stress that part, very, very early in our marriage, she asked me that one time, and I believe in being honest, and I told her. And she's never asked me again. You can say things, you know, if she says, how do I look in this? You say, well, I like that one a whole lot better. Well, no matter what we do, if we, are, if we are deceiving or attempting to deceive, it is a lie, and biblically it is a sin. We cannot blame it on the culture. 
it is still a sin. We cannot blame it on being polite if it is still a sin. And there's three ways that we can develop honesty. Number one, be honest with yourself. I don't know if you know this, but the person that we lie to more than anyone else is not our spouse, it's not our parents, it's not our boss, it's ourself. We lie to ourselves more than we lie to anyone else. And I don't know, I think this was on like Pirates of the Caribbean or something, but you know that dishonest people are dishonest. And dishonest people will lie to themselves about how dishonest they are. People who lie will lie to everyone, including themselves. They will convince themselves they are not lying. It is called justifying our sin. They will call it a perspective. From, from my perspective, that was true. It's actually called justifying our sin. In ministry, one of the hardest people to help, one of the hardest people to minister to are people who are dishonest or people who will not tell you the truth. If you try to counsel someone and they will not be honest with you, you cannot help them. If you're trying to correct someone in the church, and let me just say this, there is a biblical responsibility for that to happen within the body of Christ. We should not be so offended when someone corrects us and they're doing so with the right heart and the right motive. And even if they don't do so with the right heart, we should still be willing to receive correction. We are, far too, we are offended far, far too easy in the body of Christ. How can we point our fingers at the world saying, well, they just get offended by everything when it's probably the worst in the church today? Advice. And even in prayer. If you come for someone and you say, I want you to pray for me, and you say, well, what, what's the problem? And then they lie about it. I've, I've had people do that to me. I'm like, okay, God knows, and I actually really know, you don't know that I know, because you'd be amazed what people will tell, about, tell a pastor even more so a missionary, but, but we have to be honest. We have to be truthful. How can we help someone? How can we receive help if we're not willing to be completely open? I always, always like it on Facebook when someone says, I have a prayer request, don't ask any questions, but please pray for me. And I'm thinking, <laughs> well, thank you for, for all that information. Uh, when people will lie to you, they, they they're, they're themselves are um, they're, they're not willing to admit I have a problem. And sometimes we need to admit we are the problem. My parents' church in Alabama was split by the music minister. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not indicating anything by that. I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm not getting he, he was He was there, and my dad told the, told the pastor, hey, you don't want to do that. You don't want to hire that guy. And, my dad, and, and they did it anyway. My dad was on the board. And, and the church was split by the music minister. And so he went to another church, and then he split that church. He went to another church, and he split that church. He created his own church, and he split that church. He had a problem. He wasn't willing to admit he was the problem. Because if you split four churches, especially your own, I mean, I don't even know how you do that, but he did it, and now he's not even in, 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 in Christ at all. Sad, actually. But it's impossible to help someone who will not be honest with themselves. It's never their fault. They will not take responsibility or blame for anything. They refuse to show weakness or need. They always have an excuse or a reason for their actions. They always justify what they do or say. You simply cannot help them. But the sad thing is, if we're not honest with ourselves, God can't help us. We have to be honest with ourselves. Now, I want to say something. What I just read probably applies to every person in this room, including me. We will try to defend ourselves. I'll tell you, you know, especially when I was teaching in the seminary, when a student would, you know, kind of come up and question me a little bit, my first thought is, do you realize who you're talking to? Now, that's arrogance. That's pure pride, okay? And then you would go and you would actually do, you, you wouldn't actually ever, ever really answer their question. We can allow pride to come so much into us that we're not really willing to admit that it's our fault. That something that we did, we must take responsibility and blame. Don't worry, I'm not going to use you as an example. I'm not looking at you, Ronnie, either. No, actually, I will. Because the pastoral family, we should be the most transparent family in the church. Carrie has struggled with this in her life. Now, I know you think Carrie's perfect. Everybody does, but my goodness, she's not. Okay. Sweet spirit that you think she has. 
Now, she won't come out and outright deny something, but she don't want to take the blame for anything, okay? Now, she's gotten much, much better. But we struggled with this early in our marriage in that, you know, I would say something to her, and then she'd always have this side door that she could get around and not actually taking blame. Now, when she preaches, she can talk about me all she wants, all right? I'll be on somewhere else. <laughs> but the thing that we need to realize is that if we're not honest with ourselves, not only can the pastor not help you, not only can your brothers and sisters in Christ not help you, God can't help you. You have to be honest with yourself. God hates lying, even if we lie to ourselves. You say, well, God doesn't hate anything. Okay, let's go to the Word of God. Proverbs 12, 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. That's pretty strong. But those who act faithfully are His delight. Proverbs 6, 16 and 19. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to Him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, a hand that sheds innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that hurry to run to evil, a lying witness who testifies falsely, and one who sows discord in a family. And you could probably add in a church as well. Think about that, what he adds to that list. A lying tongue with someone who kills the innocent. And the Bible tells us that Satan is the father of lies. And what that means is that all lies, every lie, every type of deception originates from the devil himself. So that when we lie, we are being used by Satan himself. And people lie for many reasons. We lie because we hate ourselves. And you think, oh, I don't hate myself. Well, we'll get to that a little bit later. But we don't, there's things we don't like about ourselves, so we try to cover it up with lying. Things about our past that we hate, that we will lie about. Sometimes we lie because we love ourselves too much. Sometimes we lie because we're selfish. Sometimes we lie because we want glory, honor, and respect that we do not earn or deserve. Sometimes we lie because we're insecure. Sometimes we lie because we're arrogant. And usually that is a cover-up for insecurity. Sometimes we lie because we simply cannot face the truth about ourselves. We cannot admit our faults. Sometimes we lie because we are simply self-righteous and we think everything we do is right. If we cannot be honest about ourselves and our sin, we cannot be free from it. If we do not admit that we have sin, we will never be free from that sin. And lying is certainly one of those. And it must start with us. We must tell ourselves the truth. There are people that God has been placing in my life, especially since we've been in, in, in Kincaid, that I trust. There are people in this trust in this church that I know I could tell them anything. They might not always understand. They might not always be able to help me. They might not always be able to, to, to take care of the problem, but they would listen and there would be no condemnation. There are people in this church like that. I believe that with all my heart. And there are people here that I know I could tell them anything without being condemned for it. However, if we don't share our heart, if we don't share the things in our life, if we don't be honest with ourselves, none of that's going to make any difference. Because I'll tell you the person in this church that I trust the least, now don't hide under the pew yet, it's me. I don't trust myself. Why? Because I know the person that I lie to the most is me. The person that I'm going to try to convince that I'm all right is me. The person I'm going to try to convince that I'm doing a good job is me. And so I'm constantly asking God, search my heart, search me, and reveal to me, don't let me be blind to myself. Don't allow me to deceive myself. So I ask you again, are you a liar? Be honest. Again, if you exaggerate in an attempt to deceive, <laughs> if we were on, uh, I, I'll do it anyway because my brother probably don't watch my sermons. Anywhere my brother eats is the best place you've ever eaten. And if he, if he eats a place today, it's the best place he's ever eaten, and tomorrow that place will be the best place he's ever eaten. Now, I'll say this. He can eat, and he knows a lot about food. So. But sometimes we hype stuff up. We do this even in the church. This is going to be the best service you've ever been in. Well, how do you know that? 
How many services have you been in? I mean, it's the best, or this is going to be the best VBS you've ever seen. It's going to change the whole world. This youth camp that we just had, it has been historic and it's changed history. There's some exaggeration going on there. Maybe the history of individuals, maybe the history of a church or the history of a region, but not in history. We have to be very careful with exaggeration. And again, I want to, I want to really emphasize in the attempt to deceive people. Sometimes we need to avoid words like everyone, all. Sometimes we stretch the truth. Sometimes we have false flattery. And, and, and sometimes I think that's very common in the church. <laughs> now, I'm from the south. It's very common in the southern church. I don't know if it is much as here as it is there. Because in Alabama, you can say anything about someone if you put God bless their heart at the end of it. That idiot, God bless his heart. See, it, it sounds good, don't it? And then you'll have people, oh, I love you and how much I appreciate you. And you think, you hate me. <laughs> that is a lie. That's not being Christian when that, what you're saying to that person is not genuine. Cheating. Now, I probably should have brought this up last week when we were talking about stealing with plagiarism. But cheating. Cheating is a lie. I've had people cheat on minister credential exams. They're taking a test to become a pastor, and they're cheating on the test to become a pastor with biblical questions. <laughs> and then, do we do what we say? Are we people of our word? Now, I remember a time that my, you know, my grandfather and even my dad would tell me about when people did what they said they were going to do, where a handshake was enough. You know, in the Middle East, a lot of contracts are done by the shaking of a hand. There is no paperwork in a lot of contracts. I mean, I'm talking about not just little things. The building of skyscrapers sometimes is handled by two Arab men shaking a hand. Do we do what we say we're going to do? Any form of deception is a lie. The Hebrew word for lie means all deception and falsehood. The Greek word for lie means all deception and falsehood. And we're not just talking about church members here. Pastors can do be just as bad as anybody, any member of the church. They can, they can exaggerate or lie about what they do. The finances of a church. <laughs> I, I really wish sometimes that you could be flies on the wall at like camp meetings and stuff. And you hear pastors, how many are you running? And then the number they give you, you think, really? Really? Missionaries can lie. I once saw a missionary video. It wasn't, you say, well, this wasn't really lying. They just didn't understand. I, they, they understood. They would show these things from Africa where they, you see this pastor say, I invite you to come to the Lord, and thousands of people come up. Well, they don't, well, in African culture, if you use the word, in, in most African cultures, if you use the word invite, the people must respond. They must because that word is used. If I say, I invite you to come forward, by culture, they are obligated to come forward, whether they receive Jesus or not. I know missionaries who have lied in their missionary newsletters. I know of a <laughs> I was in a church where a guy was preaching on a mission service, a mission conference, and he was telling a story as if it was his own, but the story was Hudson Taylor's. I don't know if you know who Hudson Taylor is. Hudson Taylor was one of the first missionaries to China, a tremendous missionary. I mean, he'd done incredible things, but most people don't read the stories of Hudson Taylor, and this guy was telling the stories if he'd done it. We can all be guilty of this. Evangelists can lie about how many people were saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, things like that. In our reports, in our numbers, in our accomplishments, we can all exaggerate or basically lie. We must be honest with ourselves. The second way we, we create honesty in our life is to be honest with ourselves, but also be honest with others. Now, I know it's an expression, but have you ever been talking to someone they say, now, to be honest with you, and you're thinking, well, were you lying to me all before? Or I'm going to be honest with you now, and you're thinking, I guess you were not being truthful before. I know it's an expression, but we should think about sometimes what we say. God takes being honest with each other so seriously that he even tells us to confess our sins to one another. 
There's probably no greater form of honesty on this planet than confessing our sins to one another. Now, I don't mean, and the Bible does not mean, that we confess our sins to one another in order to receive eternal forgiveness. That is not why we confess our sins. The only person who can forgive us of our sins is God himself. Only through the blood of Jesus Christ can we have the forgiveness of sin. And we know, according to Scripture, that if we confess our sins to God, that He is just and that He will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You say, is it that easy? It is that easy. Confessing our sins to one another does not bring that eternal forgiveness. But it is a practice of truth is why we are told to do it. In James 5.16, he says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Not go gossip about what they confess their sins to you. Go pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of, righteous, of the righteous is power and effective. And it won't work without it. Notice that it does not say here, confess your sins to God when no one else is around or no one can hear you. Notice it does not say, confess your sins to God and make sure that you are completely alone. It doesn't say, don't let anyone hear you confess your sins, or they might think poorly of you. It says, confess your sins to one another. Why? Humility, honesty. These are two traits the Ten Commandments tell us that we need. It also provides us with accountability, and that's a word that so many people don't seem to like. Everyone in the church talks about it. That we need accountability, that we need accountability. In pastor's meetings, we talk about that all the time, how the pastors need accountability. But no one really actually wants to do what it takes to be accountable. Accountability means we have to be completely dependent and honest on the person we're being accountable to. We can't run someone down and drag their sins out of them. We have to confess one to another. And when we're honest, so honest that we confess our sin... We open the door for that person or other people to come to us and confess their sins. One thing that I've been praying for in this church since the day I arrived is that this will be a church in which people confess their sins to one another without condemnation, without gossip, without slander, that we forgive one another in an atmosphere, in a culture of transparency and weakness and openness develops. You say, it can never happen. I have a God that says otherwise. I have a God that says that if each one of us individually will do this, we will create such a culture in which people can come in here and say, I'm really struggling, I'm really struggling with this sin or that sin. I need your help, I need your prayer. And a brother or sister will say, that's all right, let's let's confess together, let's ask God to forgive, and then let's work together to keep each other accountable. And you know what it means to give someone the freedom of accountability? It means you give that person the right to question you. And we don't like that. Before I came back to America, I had several people in my life that every week would ask me certain questions of accountability based upon the things that I struggle with. Every week they would ask me, they would go down this list. And the last question they always would ask me is, did you just lie to me? Because they had asked me about this, and you know, have, you, have you dealt really good with this, and have you dealt really good with that, and have you dealt good with that? And at the you know, yes, 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 and then that last question, did you just lie to me? And I'll be honest, there's times I had to break down and say, yeah, I just lied to you. But they never would condemn me. They never would judge me. They'd say, it's all right, let's pray. Let's ask God to forgive you, and then let's move on. And you know, sometimes, sometimes I make the right choices not based in holiness or love for God. I did it because I knew they were going to ask me that week. I knew they were going to ask me those questions, and I didn't want to have to lie to them, and I didn't want to have to tell them that I had done those things, so I didn't do them in order to not, that accountability actually strengthened me and helped me. It is a good thing. Accountability is a good thing. Have you ever taken a Christian, I mean, a, a spiritual gifts test? Now, these are, these, at one time, these become very common. I've never liked them very much, okay? For one, I think these type of tests put us in a box if we're not careful. Uh, while they can tell you tendencies, they cannot tell you the move of the Spirit. 
Jesus told us that the Holy Spirit is going to move where he wills. Yeah, you might, you might operate in a certain gift for a certain period of time, but if the Holy Spirit wants you to do something else, it doesn't matter what test you've taken. It doesn't matter what your personality is. It doesn't matter where you're from or what education you have. If God wants you to do it, he's going to prepare and equip you to do it, whether you've made a certain mark on a test or not. But I've always wondered, you know, we have in the church, sometimes we'll have, you know, spiritual gift tests and strength finders tests. Why don't, they, why don't we come up with a sin test? You know, I, I bet you everybody would show up Wednesday night if I start giving sin tests, wouldn't you? <laughs> Be careful, I might do it. But we do have one. Do you know, in the church, we have a sin test. It's called the Word of God. Now, we can try to change it. We can try to go around what we don't like. We can try to manipulate it. But this is the test. This is the final word on whether or not I, what I'm doing is sin or not. Now, again, this is not for our condemnation. The Bible is not doing this. The Holy Spirit does not convict us so that we will feel bad about it, that we will feel guilty or condemned. Remember, the word convict can easily be translated convince, that the Holy Spirit is trying to convince us that what we're doing is not good for us and that if we will come to God, He will cleanse us of that and help us with that and strengthen us with that and make us better people. He's trying to convince us of our sin, not make us guilty about it. Have you ever wondered why people don't post their sins on Facebook or social media? I mean, why not? Post everything else. Have you, I, I, I'll be honest, I've been very tempted to do this. That I just committed a sin. S smiley face. <laughs> You say, well, people would think you're awful. And you still don't worry too much about what people think about you? You know, as Americans, we want to say, I don't care what anybody thinks. Okay, then post your sin tomorrow on Facebook. You know what happens when we confess our sin? Yes, there's, going to, there's always going to be people who talk about you, but who cares about them? They're so far outside of the love of God, they're not going to understand what I'm going to say anyway. It brings it from the darkness into the light. It takes away its strength. It mortifies it. It weakens it. It doesn't have the power over you that, you that it had before. When you bring it in the light and you confess it to a brother or sister in Christ, a friend, someone who's not going to condemn you, someone who's going to pray with you, and I hope that there are more and more people as we develop and grow in this church closer to God, that that will happen, that we will just confess our sins. I'm really struggling with this. And that's okay, brother. That's okay, sister. We're going to get through this together. I'm, you know, and if, most of us, if we're honest, we're going to be able to say, I struggle with the same thing. But bring it into the darkness. Bring it out of the darkness into the light. There are basically three kinds of people in this world. One, wise. Wise people. Now, I know everyone's going to say, I know, I know what you're thinking. That's me. This is what, how I would define a wise person in terms of honesty. You can correct them and help them. They will be honest with themselves and they will be honest with others. They will always try to adapt themselves to the truth. They welcome and desire correction. They will change to line up with the truth. They are thankful for correction. They might not like it, it might hurt them, but they will appreciate it. Now would we call ourselves wise. Would you think yourself wise if someone was to come to you today and tell you, I need, to, I need to rebuke you. The second type of person is the foolish person. They will make excuses for everything. They will try to turn it all around on you and try to even bring up past things that you've done. They will adapt the truth to themselves. They will never receive correction. Proverbs 9 and 8 says, A scoffer who is rebuked will only hate you. The wise, when rebuked, will love you. They cannot be corrected with words or consequences and sometimes not even consequences. You can't talk with them and they won't listen and they won't change. And ultimately, it's because they're dishonest. There are things in their life they cannot be honest with themselves or with others about. And they're trapped. The third type of person is simply an evil person. They reject anything you do and the Bible tells us that if you go to them on two different occasions and they eject it both times, that you should reject them. Titus 3.10, 
in verse 11, after the first and second admonition, having nothing more to do with anyone who causes division, since you know that a person is perverted and sinful, being self-condemned. The Bible speaks pretty harshly about people who speak against the church, pretty harshly about people who try to divide the church. But you can't help them. Please, please, be honest with yourself and be honest with others. Why would we want to live a lie? Why would we want people to like, respect, and honor us for something that is not true, not real? You think people, you, we want people to think we're cool, but you're not cool if you're lying because it's not real. And, and it's definitely not cool to the one who really matters to God. And by being honest, it will free us from trying to be two people, the one in public and the one in private, the one who wears two faces. You don't have to lie. Be yourself. Why? And you say, well, you don't know me. You don't know who I am. You don't know how pathetic I am. You don't, you don't. Jesus died for you. He didn't die for the person we pretend to be. He didn't die for the person we lie like we're trying to make people believe we are. He died for who we truly are. And if Jesus Christ, the Son of the Most High God, is willing to die for you, you can be yourself. And this is something that I wrote down, and I, I, I don't take any credit for it because I believe, I, I don't say God said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very frightful of those words, but I believe that God gave me this, and I hope it speaks into your heart. You can never become the person God wants you to be until you first become yourself. Until you become the real you and, you, and you accept the real you, God can't change you into who he wants you to be. But if you will accept who we are, if we will accept who we are, be honest with ourselves, be honest with others, he can transform us and change the real us, but he cannot help a false person, a person who is not really us. If we lie, we are in bondage to the devil, and one day it might cost us more than we ever know. Let God and others help you. Many times God wants to help people through others, and I will say in my life, most of the time, God doesn't come down from heaven to do what needs to be done, he sends someone into my life. Like I shared yesterday with Sharon, God didn't come down in heaven and say, I'm glad you came to Kincaid. He used other people, including Sharon, to tell me those words. But if you don't open up our life, if we don't open up and be honest and be transparent with people, they can't possibly be used by God to help us because we deny even, even receiving what they have from, from us from the Lord. Let God and others help us. We are not fooling God, and honestly, we're not fooling other people either. And sadly, like I said, this is true in a lot of churches. Pastors and leaders try to be something that they're not. People want to be seen as spiritual when they're full of weakness. And, it, and no, matter, no matter if we're doing a good, you know, if they think, I'm, I'm really growing in the Lord, that's great. I want everyone in this church to grow in the Lord. But you're not growing in the Lord because of you. You're growing in the Lord because of Him, because of what He did on the cross, because of the Holy Spirit at work in you. Yes, you're participating with Him. You're attending church. You're praying. You're fasting. You're reading the Bible and studying the Bible, and you're participating with what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life, and that's what is helping in that growth. But He still gets all the glory. He still gets all the credit. We have nothing to boast in except in our own weakness, as Paul reminds us. So be honest with ourselves. And be honest with others. And finally, be honest with God. Can you imagine how God must feel when we lie to him? Now, I know it makes me mad when people lie to me because I'm thinking, you think I'm an idiot? What about God when we lie to him? Think about it. We've sinned, and we try to hide it from God Almighty. Now, you might be hiding it from your spouse, you might be hiding it from your kids or your family or your boss or your workplace or your neighbors. But to hide it from God. We pray every day, hopefully, and never mention that sin that we're involved in. Like it's not even happening. Like he doesn't know about it. 
When people lie to me, I feel insulted. How much more God grieved. Have, I, I don't know, for those of you who've been parents and had little kids, have you ever had a little, you, your son or your daughter, they have something they're not supposed to have, and they put it behind their back, and you say, what is that? Nothing. Well, let me see it. No, it's nothing. I think that's the way we are with God, with our sin. I didn't do anything. I come to church every Sunday. I love my wife. I work hard. Pay all my bills. Good to my neighbors. I'm good. And we got that behind our back. You know the amazing thing when we hide our sin from God, when we're not willing to confess it, is that he has already paid for it through the death of Jesus Christ. What we're hiding from God, what we're holding back, he already paid the price for our forgiveness. How stupid can we be? We don't want to be honest with him about it. We won't repent. And so we don't receive forgiveness for the price. And, and he's already paid the price. Repentance is such an easy thing. Repentance is such an easy thing because Jesus Christ made it easy. But it does require that I be honest with myself, honest with others, and honest with God. Every week in this church, people have the opportunity to repent. And what does it take? Coming down. Why do we fear this down here so much? You say, we don't fear it. A lot of people never come to it. Because when you get out of your pew, that means you're being honest with yourself. When you walk down here, you're being honest with everybody else. And when you kneel or call out to God, you're being honest with God. Walking to the altar is used in the church because it requires honesty with all three people. Myself, my brothers and sisters, and with God. But many of us are not willing to be that honest. Pride keeps us back. Too many people in the church are dishonest with God about how they are, how they live, how they live their lives, how much they pray, how much they fast, how much they read the Bible, and even more so in church. The root of all sin is pride, and the root of all lying is pride as well and dishonesty. We think that we can deal with things ourselves. We think that we can conquer our own sin. We think that we would rather look good to the world than to admit our weaknesses to our, our church family and to God. We think that we can do this on our own. If you think you can do it on your own, there's a word for that. It's called self-righteousness. And what that does is it, it takes the righteousness that Jesus offers all of us and pushes it away and claims our own in its place. Such a strange thing that we're not willing to confess the truth to the one who already knows the truth. Psalm 32, 1 and 5. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. I'm going to stop right there. How many of you want to be happy? All right, some of you want to be miserable. We can make that happen too, okay? I'll, I'll prepare some miserable sermons coming up. This might be one. Who knows? We want to be happy. So how can you be happy? Have your trans, trans, transgressions forgiven. How can that happen? Confess. Confess. Confess them to the Lord. Happy are those whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as the heat of the summer. Salah. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Salah. Now, the word salah just simply, we, we don't actually know what it means. It could have been, a, you know, most of the psalms were songs. They were sung. It could have been a pause in the music. It could have been that what I just said, I'm lifting to the Lord. It could have been also mean and forever more. It's not truly known what the word means. But what this, this psalm points out to us is there is no peace without confession. Have you ever made the statement, I have to get this off my chest? Why is it on your chest? Why is that heaviness there? 
because you haven't let it go. You're holding it in. And, he's, and, and the, the writer of this psalm tells us that you know, when I was hiding from my sin from God, I felt miserable. Now, I don't know about you, but when I, when I, when I sin and I, you know, and, and I, I want to delay repentance, and I'm, I feel horrible. I, I, you know, I just don't have the same feeling. I just don't have the same peace. I don't have the same joy. I don't have the same. And it's not because God withdrew from you. It's not because God withdrew from me. When we sin, God does not withdraw from us. We withdraw from him. Because when we sin, we place something between us and God. When we sin, we are the one backing away. He has not moved. It is us that moves away. Our, our, our lives will feel heavy. I don't know if you remember the day that you were saved, that heaviness you feel. And if you're not saved, that heaviness you feel right now. Or maybe you're hiding a sin and you think you're hiding it from God and hiding it from your family or hiding it even from yourself and you feel right now a weight upon you, this, 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 this burden upon you. I promise you, if you will call upon the name of the Lord, you will feel freedom. You will feel freedom like you cannot possibly imagine. That peace that does surpass all understanding. I remember when I gave my life to Christ and I could literally, I mean just literally almost like feel chains falling off of me as all I could say is, God, I am sorry. I am sorry. I felt freedom. I told the pastor of the church, I feel like I could run through the wall. And he said, please, don't do that. <laughs> Be honest with yourself. Be honest with others. Be honest with God. You know, for those of us who've had kids, one thing I learned very quickly, you don't have to teach kids to lie. You have to teach them to not lie. They're born with the ability to lie. I mean, that's the sinful nature. And again, we always say, oh, such a sweet little baby. They're not sweet. They're born with a sinful nature. I had two of them. They were evil as they could right when they came out. <laughs> Keeping me up all night, pooping everywhere, feed me, feed me, feed me. And what doesn't sweet about my two little girls? I don't know, maybe yours were different. You had to teach them to not do those things. I remember when Kendra was six months old, she would push Leander and then pretend like she didn't do it. Six months old. She's still trying to get away with that stuff. We're born with the ability to lie. And the fact is, we just get good at it. We just get better at it. Or not. <laughs> Some people are really bad at it. We try to turn things in our favor by lying to ourselves, lying to others, and lying to God. But let us start today and be honest, no matter what it costs. Today, God wants to set us free. And when I say us, I include me. Although I may never walk down to these altars every time I give an altar call, when I preach a sermon, it's because I've lived it. It's because I've had to confess it. It's because I've had to go through it or that I am still going through it. And I am. And so when I give this altar call, I am also responding. We sometimes want to lift up pastors and preachers into this level that no one should ever be lifted up to other than Jesus Christ himself. We are just as guilty of sin as anyone else, no matter how much we try to hide it. And let's just be honest, pastors and people in the church, we can try to hide it more than anybody else. But I refuse to let my sin control me because I try to keep it hidden. I will not be controlled by anything, as Paul says, because Jesus alone will be my master. Even my sin will not control me. And if you think you have a sinless pastor, you hired the wrong person. And if you think you're in a sinless church, <laughs> you, brought it, you brought it in, so don't blame, don't blame God. But today, God wants to set us free from dishonesty. So what is God saying to you through this message? I would like for you to stand. Now I don't ever, ever, ever want to embarrass anyone and that is never why I ask people to come forward. My tendency is to try to make it easy on people about coming forward. But today can't be one of those days. I'd like for you to start to pray and I would like for you to pray God, search my heart. Am I hiding this from myself? Do I lie 
to myself? Am I hiding my struggles and my sins from my brothers and sisters in Christ, my church family, those who care about me? Am I even trying to hide it from you who knows all things, who sees all things? But not anymore. Today, I'm going to make a statement to myself, to my church, and to God Almighty that I am going to pray to be a more honest person.